thank you everyone for joining this breakout session. And I'm here to introduce Ahmad Barami with the Fresno County Department of Behavioral Health for Teamwork is the Dream Work presentation. Thank you, Jessica. Um, as Jessica said, my name is Ahmad Barami and I'm a division manager here at the Fresno County Department of Behavioral Health. Um, I oversee a lot of our Mental Health Services Act work, but also our suicide prevention efforts. Uh, and I've been involved with the Department of Ed Student Mental Health Policy Workgroup for a number of years. So uh, I have a good experience of, of how do we address some of these issues, both in the behavioral side as well as with our LEAs. So um, do we have those slides ready, Green? Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, I'm going to kick off the, the presentation and I'll be really brief, kind of giving you a couple of key points. And then I will be turning it over to my colleagues, uh, Brandy and Trish, who will really give you more of the details and nuances of our, of our collaborative. Um, so the development of the collaborative, just real quickly so that you guys get some context, was something that, that came about as a result of some of the community events and, and things that, that Brandy will touch on. But really the, the, the need was for us to go beyond just having conversations and us just kind of saying that there's an issue and really doing something proactive uh, to be able to move uh, the suicide prevention efforts uh, forward. And we needed to figure out a way to get the right people to the table, identify what are the resources, identify what are the needs, um, really just figuring out what we needed to do. And so the formation of the collaborative was really intended to do that. Um, the collaborative uh, was, was developed because we knew that no one individual, no one organization, no one sector can really address um, suicide and suicide prevention on its own, but collectively, we have a better chance and opportunity to do that. And so that's where the collaborative was born out of. And at the same time, um, county behavioral health departments uh, have funding that we receive through the Mental Health Services Act, specifically the prevention and early intervention components, um, have six strategies. And one of those strategies is to utilize prevention, early intervention, and, and those Mental Health Service Act funds to address specifically suicide prevention. So counties have been trying to do the work on suicide prevention, funding different efforts, but again, a lot of that was siloed and it was, was being done in one sector. And the collaborative for us was a way of really let's support a truly countywide effort around those effort, around those, those options, interventions, and, and prevention um, activities. So uh, that, that's just a quick background of, of kind of how the collaborative is fun and supported. Perfect. Thank you, Brandy. Um, suicide prevention legislation starting around 2016 really started, I think, bringing our LEAs and behavioral health together. Uh, if you think back to AB 2246 that called for um, LEA staff to get trained, developing plans, things of that sort, um, and really for us how to how do we connect in those. And, and some of the legislation that impacted LEAs were unfunded mandates. Going back to, again, the Mental Health Services Act, we have funding for services and to try to do things around suicide prevention. So it really helped us come together. And, and Brandy and, and Trish will go into it later. But our, our collaborative goes beyond just the LEAs and, and mental health, but we have public health, healthcare, first responders, um, you know, families, faith. It, it, it is definitely a, a broad uh, collaborative that she'll, she'll talk into. But um, some of the efforts, well, a lot of the efforts through our collaborative then are, are supported, as I said, through Mental Health Services Act dollars, specifically the suicide prevention strategy under the PEI component. So some of it has been the administrative functions, just how do we leverage resources? How do we fund services? How do we coordinate some of those efforts? Um, but then also uh, identifying uh, efforts, interventions, and specific goals and strategies we want to do. And so those have been everything from funding programs, which one is actually on in the other breakout session right now. I know the LOST team, um, the Central Valley Suicide Prevention Lifeline, for example, we fund through the MHSA dollars and, and the work. We're utilizing um, MHSA dollars to try to establish a follow-up call program that is going before the state commission next month to try to get approval. Um, looking at doing LGBTQ pop-up groups, uh, death review. So those are all things that uh, require some additional support. So the, the death review, for example, it's getting the, the individuals that would be involved with that, the formal training necessary for doing those types of reviews, suicide, um, autopsy, psychological autopsy, things of that sort. Um, some of the program services also is a lot of awareness, stigma reduction. Um, we utilize some of those fundings, for example, to provide technical assistance uh, for our local LEAs to write their plans. So there, there's a lot of things that, that have been able to be done cross-sector trainings. We've been able to establish 
the trainings you may have already heard about, things like QPR, Mental Health First Aid, Suicide 101, Assist, Safe Talk. But we've also tried to take those trainings out and, and, and identify specialized trainings that are needed for medical providers, for first responders, for faith communities, things of that sort. And so that work is, is then also driven by our sub work groups. So for, out of the collaborative, we have specific work groups, um, education, first responders, healthcare, uh, communications, things like that. And through those works, we're, through those work groups, we're able to tackle, I guess, if you would say the, the more nuanced pieces of our prevention efforts. And, and really being able to move that forward. Brandy, if you can go to the last line for me, perfect. Um, so I, I, I can't emphasize enough um, the need to have a plan if you're gonna be doing this work. Um, I, I think having a suicide prevention plan is critical. Um, it guides your efforts. It helps you identify what resources you have, what programs you have, what you need, um, what is your capacity? Um, what is it that you're trying to measure? How do you know what's working? Uh, so you can do more of it. How do you know maybe what was not working? So maybe to change up some of those resources and plans. And for us in Fresno County, our suicide prevention plan drives our work. But because it is a living document, we also drive that plan. Um, so it's, it's, it's really beneficial to having that. Um, I think without having a plan, it's, it's, you're, you're kind of piecemealing then what, what you're trying to do. You're not sure if you have everyone. What is the goal? What are you trying to achieve? And also just as human nature that as you're able to achieve tangible um, goals and objectives, um, you get that positive reinforcement, you get that, you know, good feeling. And so for us having a plan and being able to check off things that we've been able to institute and, and then develop as you see, and you know, and on this slide, um, it does, it does help build momentum and it keeps people active and going in that. So it's really, really important, I think, to have those suicide prevention plans. That's been, you know, the cornerstone for all of our work. Uh, Santa Clara, who's a county that developed theirs, I think they were one of the first ones to develop it. Um, theirs is going into, I think, like year 13 or 14, somewhere in that area. And it took a couple of years, but since they've had that plan, they've actually seen um, suicides, death by suicides trending down. And in Fresno County, our numbers were continuing to peak. And from the time we've developed this collaborative, having a plan and really being able to address and, and put some strategies in place, we've seen that plateau. And this year we've seen a slight drop off. It's not a big drop off, but we've seen a slight uh, reduction in deaths by suicide. And we really feel that having a plan, having this collaborative, having us work together across sectors for some common goals is really the things that, that, that are driving that. And with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Brandy, uh, and Brandy will introduce herself and run you through a little bit more about our collaborative. Thanks. As Ahmad, uh, as Ahmad said, my name is Brandy Libeck. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in uh, Fresno County. And um, I'm also serving as the chair for the Suicide Prevention uh, Collaborative here in Fresno County and uh, helped start that loss team that Ahmad referenced earlier. And so we have a lot of information to cover. So we're going to plow through some of these slides. And then if you have any questions, hopefully we'll have time at the end to to answer any of those. But uh, how it all started is in 2016, we had a large cluster of teen suicides throughout the county. I believe we had 14 under the age of 18 in that year. And so all the key stakeholders in the, in the community came together. So that was like hospitals and law enforcement and teachers, um, school systems, you know, um, agencies, DBH, uh, Department of Behavioral Health, all came together and said, hey, let's let's do whatever we can to prevent teen suicide. But then as they were kind of working at further, they said, you know what, let's, let's look at it as suicides in general. And so out of that tragedy of that year, uh, the collaborative was born. And like I said, these are all the cross sectors that are involved and there's so many more. Uh, any, any meeting we can have between 60 and 100 people present um, and that serves all populations. And, um, and, and it's, it's been a really, a really neat thing to see come together. So the big thing that we wanted to do was to create a strategic plan. And that was, what is the mission? What is our purpose? What are we trying to achieve? And how are we gonna do that? And so what we didn't wanna do is create this amazing strategic plan. We were all on, on board with it and then have it go sit on a shelf where we never reference it or never do anything from it. And so we wanted it to not collect dust, but rather to be a living document to be updated. So if we say, this is our plan for this year and something comes up you know, in the way, an obstacle, then we look at the barriers and, and kind of sort through and figure out if our goals are you know, heading in the right direction instead of, oh, it's too unattainable, we're not gonna ever touch it. So we have created this wonderful living document. Um, and with that, we have created an accountability to accomplish these goals. So 
we meet as a steering team, which is the leadership team that runs this collaborative and Ahmad and myself and Trish are on there as well. And so at the end of every meeting, uh, which, which is a lot of planning for the collaboratives next meeting, but also trying to get all these work goals in place. At the end of every meeting, we say, who's gonna do what by when, right? Because what we don't wanna do is just attend another meeting. We all have plenty of those to attend. We don't need to add another one. That could have been an email. So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? Who's gonna do it? Who's the team? Who are you answering to? So that we have some accountability because it's worthless to show up every month and be like, oh, we're still no further along than we were six months ago. And that that's a waste of everyone's time. So. Uh, that's how we kind of run our meetings. And then uh, we do have ongoing conversations, not only with the leadership team, but also the collaborative as a whole. What is working? What is not? What do you need in order to get more involved and engaged? Uh, what is not working? How can we improve that? Um, and so those are conversations that we're constantly having and not being afraid of the answers because it's not personal. It's just if, if we want to see results, we need to be willing to have these conversations. So um, extending conversation. So data drives our actions. So uh, the coroner and the hospitals and the hotline, um, they're all part of our uh, steering team as well. And so if the coroner says, hey, we had an influx of, of suicides this month, and they're usually fitting in this demographic, whether it's this age, this ethnicity, this zip code, whatever it is, um, we kind of start focusing some of our attention towards that or the hospitals. And I'll give you an example in a few minutes on the next slide, um, but also like the suicide hotline, uh, they will say, hey, we have an influx of people calling this month. And so kind of being prepared or getting more volunteers in place. So we're always in communication with one another because it, there's, there's no way anybody can do this on their own, right? So we're all kind of, I know that I could pick up the phone at any time and say, hey, what are the schools doing about this? Or what is the hospital doing about this? And then by the end of the conversation, we have a plan in place to figure out um, how to best proceed. So all areas are intertwining their reach. So uh, like I said, there's schools and hospitals are meeting constantly. How do we um, provide Res ongoing resources and support for a family whose teen just attempted, right, without releasing HIPAA information. Um, but how do we notify the school so that this kid doesn't fall through the cracks, but he's rather getting follow up when he returns back to school the next morning, right? Um, schools and law enforcement, community organizations and first responders, uh, trainings and conferences are always collaborating. We're kind of working on right now a catalog of sorts where uh, we have a Fresno Cares website and people will be able to go on there and say, I need a training for CEUs or I need a training for, for this. And where is the next one? And when is the next one? And how do I register? And it'll all be there because we won't be able to um, focus on that. And then we're always having meetings in between the meetings. So it's not just like, okay, we'll meet again next month and talk about the same thing because we haven't, we haven't progressed but rather uh, having meetings in between. So um, some of our successes together have been really cool. So like I mentioned earlier, being part of the loss team and the loss team, if you're not familiar, is a team um, that shows up to a suicide loss scene 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they provide immediate support and resources to a family who just lost someone to suicide. And they're providing kids books, uh, no charge therapy in the county, um, ongoing, uh, support for the first year or additional if the family needs it. So that's been a really, really neat asset to our county. Um, and this year, our county suicide numbers, like Ahmad mentioned, are down for the first time in several years. And conversely, our prevention hotline numbers are going up, which uh, some might be alarmed by that, but that actually shows that our resources are working. So our suicides are down and, and people calling for support and calling for help is going up. So that's amazing. Um, prevention trainings within the county are ongoing. Uh, Fresno Cares website, like I mentioned, one-stop shopping. So you can get a whole bunch of information there. I encourage you to check it out after this. Um, hospitals inform collaboratives. So this was the, the example that I alluded to earlier. We recently had uh, 17 suicide attempts by teens in a 24 hour span between three major hospitals here in the county. And so one of the main uh, lead manager social workers gave me a call and said, hey, we had uh, like nine or 10 just last night at her hospital in the last 24 hours of teens attempting. And so I said, what on earth? So I reached out to the rest of the steering team and they reached out and made some calls and figured out that the other hospitals actually had an influx as well. And so we're, what are we going to do about this? So Trish, uh, Trish's team put together a meeting by the end of the day, which involved hospitals, the suicide prevention hotline, uh, Ahmad's team at Department of Behavioral Health, 
uh, school districts, myself, and we all kind of got together. What are we going to do? Because this was right before a weekend for the holidays. So how are we going to do this? So by the end of that meeting with everybody on board, we had created a text alert that had gone out to every parent in the Clovis Unified, Fresno Unified, and uh, additional districts as well. Of like, here are the signs of suicide. Here are what to look for with your teens. Here are to have the conversation. And here are the resources in the county because we're seeing an influx of uh, attempts. And we want to make sure that parents are prepared to kind of see these signs in their kids. Uh, media was also involved and they sent out emails or um, articles and there was a news, um, a news piece done on it as well. And that was because one person in our collaborative reached out to say, hey, I'm noticing something that is concerning, reached out to us. And by the end of the day, we had all this in place uh, by Friday at 4 p.m. before a long holiday weekend. So that's some of the cool things that comes from the collaborative of everybody kind of being on board and um, wanting wanting what's best for our community. So data-driven, like I mentioned, we have adapted uh, adopted the CSSRS training, um, which is kind of like so that everybody's on the same page with the same wording and how to, um, how to assess for suicidality. And then drive-through events. We recently had two different drive-through events and they, we located them at two different high schools in the community, both in the highest suicide loss zip codes. So we have one in Clovis and one in Fresno where the most suicides had occurred. And so we said, let's target those zip codes and we had a drive through fair where families could come and pick up resources and information about not even just suicide, but mental health, well being, physical well being, everything in the community that we could provide uh, resources for. Uh, some of our upcoming projects, born in the collaborative, is a gunshot uh, means reduction, which is coming. We're going to kind of announce that further in the, in the coming months, but that's kind of how to. Um, partner with gun shops, not to take away gun ownership by any means, but rather to say, hey, if you have someone come in who might be suicidal, how can we get them information? How can we help them? We're also um, helping uh, with another colleague, Ken, work on the suicide review team so that we can look at all the suicides in the county and say, hey, what are some commonalities and how can we take that information and use it to work on prevention uh, moving forward? And then continuing education programs and then follow-up program is one. So if an individual leaves the hospital, who follows up with them? How are we making sure that they're not following um, through the cracks? And so we would have a, a team in, uh, to follow up with that individual once they left. Okay, I think I did that pretty quickly. I'm gonna turn this over to Trish now um, and she'll follow. Good job. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Trish Small, and I work at the office of the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools. And um, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about the work that we've done at the at the schools work group. So this is Fresno County. Um, it's 6,000 square miles. We have 32 school districts, and um, some many are in the metro area, but we also have a lot of districts that are out in the rural areas that are very remote. Um, so they have a different set of needs and barriers to access. Um, so you can go ahead and advance, uh, Brandy, go ahead and next slide, because I kind of covered this. Um, so, so Ahmad talked about how, and Brandy about how this got started in terms of community conversations. And during those initial stages, that was um, when the schools were invited to attend, that was really focused on our district leadership. So our superintendents were invited. And at the same time, that suicide prevention and awareness legislation was coming into being. And so the, the importance of suicide prevention and awareness um, was really getting on the radar of our schools and our school leadership, which um, really helped with the engagement in the community conversations and to the development of the, the suicide prevention collaborative. So over time, after we got, um, the districts really bought into and prioritized suicide prevention. Most of the districts assigned a, um, a designee to be the representative for the collaborative. Uh, next slide. And some of those folks that um, superintendents assigned that to were, I mean, we have a whole variety. It depended on the district. Um, sometimes it's directors, program managers, school psychologists, clinicians. Um, it was, just depends on the makeup of the school district and who really are the key people in the district who are um, doing the work around suicide prevention and taking the lead on that for the district. Next slide. Uh, so 
Um, one of the really great things that came out of this, which um, Brandy and, and Ahmad um, touched on, was the opportunities uh, for networking and supporting each other. So, um, so one of the, Brandy, I think we went one too many. Go back. Yes, so um, we had lots of networking opportunities and we got to meet all of our community partners outside of the schools, which was awesome. Um, and we were able to leverage resources and share space for some of the activities that we did together, um, come together to provide trainings and um, other kinds of networking opportunities. So go ahead to the next slide. Okay. Um, we also had an opportunity to really connect with each other as school districts and, um, and support each other. So we have lots of really big districts that have um, lots of infrastructure, lots of mental health folks, have good processes in place and forms that they developed around um, tracking kids and making sure that kids don't fall between the cracks. But then we had a lot of districts that are small and don't have a lot of resources. So um, being able to share all these things with each other and strengthen, um, strengthen the processes that all the districts had in place was really helpful. Um, the other thing that we do is um, when there is a crisis, any kind of a crisis, it doesn't need to be necessarily a suicide, but any kind of a sudden loss. Um, our Fresno County Superintendent of Schools Office has a crisis team that deploys out to a small district to provide whatever support that, that they may need. Um, one of the things that developed out of the work group was developing a um, district crisis contact liaison list um, so that if districts need to reach out to each other, they know who that mental health point of contact is. Um, many times our kids move around a lot. And so when one district receives a new student and they know that that student has a history of um, mental health concerns and crisis and possibly um, suicide attempt or ideation, um, we can just pick up that list, call that point person in the former district and say, hey, who can you connect me with so that I can get all of the information and history that I need so that we can start to support this kid right now on day one, now that they've come to us. Next slide. Uh, we also developed a district crisis contact list for emergency departments. So um, as Brandy said, we've had um, several conversations with our, our emergency department and health partners. And we have identified that one of the challenges that we have in our county is that we don't always know when our kids are 5150, um, whether they're held for a short period of time or they end up being um, held for a long period of time and put into a long-term placement. And so sometimes kids, this happens, they come back, they come to school, we treat them as if you know it's a regular day and their needs are no different than any other student's needs when in fact, they're very much in a fragile place and are needing a lot of support and a re-entry plan. Um, so the goal of our uh, crisis contact list is that the emergency departments have a list of, of folks in the school so that with parent consent, um, the emergency departments can contact um, somebody at the school and say, hey, this student has had a crisis. We want to talk to you so that we can help get things set up for them to return to school and be well supported. Um, that there are lots of, of things to overcome in terms of that communication, HIPAA laws, um, release of information, but it is a work in progress and we're all in a place where we want that to work. And uh, and the, the, the list of, um, of school staff really facilitates that. Um, another thing that happened, um, we have the emergency department contact list and that we learned when schools really started in earnest to do all the suicide prevention and awareness training um, that we had unintendedly um, brought about more 5150 referrals because of that dialogue around suicide prevention. Um, and, and kind of reducing the stigma around talking about it and talking about having those thoughts. So while the schools had an increase in um, 5150 referrals, the emergency departments weren't prepared for that. Um, and, and fortunately, we had developed a relationship where we people reached out and said, hey, this is what happened. Can we talk about it and talk about why and what we can do to help prevent this from happening in the future? 
Um, so we created, uh, we know who the emergency departments are and our schools now contact their local emergency departments to say, hey, on this week and on these days, we're gonna be doing our training. And then emergency departments in turn can say, okay, we're gonna be, we're gonna be more staffed with mental health folks on those days or we're gonna at least have them on call so that we'll be prepared um, in case we do have an increase in referrals at that time. Next slide. Um, we did some work with the law enforcement work group, which was wonderful. We, we really it helped them understand what our process is in the schools and it helped us understand where they're coming from when they're dealing with a 5150 so that we could um, we can coordinate better around that. Um, they also helped us to develop a really comprehensive crisis resource list that was, became very helpful during COVID and that we will continue to use into the future. Next slide. Okay, um, and one of the things that we did, um, you know, we've been doing the suicide prevention for a while and we're all using similar programs um, and to kind of freshen that up and uh, bolster our investment in suicide prevention in the schools, we created a, a, a local video um, and we had um, several staff from our local school districts. We had transition age youth, a parent, a high school teacher, um, the Department of Behavioral Health, Brandy and Ahmad, and um, the suicide uh, the Central Valley Suicide Prevention Hotline, and they made an awesome video, um, and you can access it through that link on YouTube. Um, and we really just, we wanted to make the conversation around suicide more personal, and um, in the hopes that it would really reach and speak to our school staff and our parents and our students um, to really reduce stigma around suicide and, and and reduce those barriers to accessing help. All right, next slide. Okay, uh, another connection that we made was with our local NAMI, um, Chris Roop, who's in charge of NAMI Fresno, um, who's been a great partner. Uh, we've hosted two NAMI on-campus trainings and we've trained nine uh, districts and we have six active clubs. Um, this has been, this has just been really exciting for us. Um, the stigma reduction piece is huge. And these clubs, these kids are amazing. Um, and the work that they're doing around stigma reduction on their campuses is just, um, it's so powerful. And it dovetails into um, another project that we're doing with um, the superintendent of schools office that I'll talk about in just a moment. Next slide. Okay, um, some of our ongoing uh, work is data tracking. We're working on that. Um, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scales. Uh, we're always talking about training and how we can make that, uh, improve that community outreach projects. Um, and again, stigma reduction. The Fresno County Superintendent of Schools Office has, um, we, all, we have a, a, a contract and a partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health and uh, um, so we're providing mental health services in the schools. So that's, that's another effort towards suicide prevention. And then these are the one pagers that we've developed, um, as resources for the community and for the schools, and you can find them on Fresno cares. And I'm going to stop so that we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, but you can access those on fresnocares.org. So on behalf of our team, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. We had one question come in um, and it was around the list when you were connecting with people um, from the, with the emergency department, how people can become a, a part of that list of agencies um, and add it as a contact. And Trish, you're muted. Yeah, um, that is a local list that's unique to just our county. And so if you wanted us to send out a template of what that list looks like, it basically lists every district and there's one representative for each district and then a phone number and email address for how um, they can be reached. That's the, the schools list. And then in terms of the emergency departments, we just sat down at the table with the emergency departments. We listed them all out as a group and I, then each one identified who they wanted their designated person to be and, I, and provided their phone number and their email address. So I hope, I hope that helps answer the question. Yeah, I think making that personal connection with somebody um, is so key. Very much so. And we 